Good morning. So can we actually get people to fill in to the top? Can we bring it in a little bit, make it a little bit more intimate since we've got enough space? Exactly. Get closer. So thank you. So we're going to have a really lively conversation already, I can tell, because of all the laughter and everything going on in this panel. Uh, we're among friends. Uh, my name is Rodney Foxworth. I'm executive director of Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And I'm pleased to be able to, you know, sort of try to host and moderate this conversation um, between these great people um, around investing in local economies for racial equity. Um, I'm going to just try to set the stage a little bit for this conversation because I think all of us on the panel, everyone here for this conversation um, probably has lived this quite a bit um, and understands the importance of why racial equity is important um, for having a thriving local economy. So just for some, you know, just some, some staging and to ensure that we understand where we are in terms of the need for addressing the question of racial equity and addressing racial inequality, particularly in the U.S. We're going to focus on the U.S. for this conversation. Um, but some troubling data that I think is really sort of driving these conversations, particularly of late. One of the things that we really have um, sort of thought about and, and it was revealed, I think, two years ago um, by Prosperity Now when they, did, they issued a report that indicated that if the current economic trajectory continued in the United States, that by 2053, the median household wealth for African-American households would be zero. Um, and in, obviously in many communities, for example, in the city of Boston, where a number of the folks that we work with at Bali uh, are situated, the uh, median household wealth for African-Americans is already at $8. And according to the Federal Reserve. So I just wanted to like provide some context for this and also to recognize that we're going to be a majority people of color country by 2040, 2043 or so, depending on what kind of data that you're, you're looking at. And so one of the questions that I always have, that I always like to pose is, what happens when we have a majority people of color country in which African Americans, Latinos, and other communities of con uh, color are actually um, below poverty line, right? I have zero to little wealth. What does that look like for all of us? So I'd like to make sure that we, we talk about this conversation in the, in the, from the perspective that it's not just an African-American, Latino, indigenous communities challenge. It's actually a challenge for all of us. Um, so I wanted to set that grounding for why the work of the folks on this panel and many of the folks at, this, uh, at SOCAP is so vitally important. Um, so I'm actually gonna start to go uh, from my right and introduce Amaka Agbu. Um, she is actually, I mean, Amaka Agbu Consulting, which really means that she is incorporated. She has numerous subsidiaries of, of wit, <laughs> of impact, uh, is one way to put it. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm speaking truth. I like to speak truth on this panel, okay? Um, so Amaka is, is amazing, has been a great inspiration for me. Um, I'm going to let her kind of kick off the conversation. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to quickly introduce the other panelists. I'm going to introduce Mary Lassendona, who is at um, Mandela Partners. He's also a Bali Fellow, which I'm enthused about, um, as well as Alan Woods from Mortar in Cincinnati, which is actually also run one by one of his partners, is Derek Brazil, who's one of the Bali Fellows as well. And last but not least, Ingrid Jacobson from ICA Fund Good Jobs, which is, of course, an amazing organization. We've got quite a few folks here from ICA Fund Good Jobs here today and some alumni as well. But... I want to kick off with Amaka because I, I, she has this, as I, as I told her the other, night, the other night, I revealed that I have her on almost every pitch uh, deck that I have and having a conversation about wealth and equality because one of the reasons why she's such a great inspiration for me is because she has this concept around restorative economics. And I think the concept is really a great segue for having this conversation. So Amaka, can you explain a bit about what restorative, restorative economics means to you? Sure, sure. Thanks, Rodney. And I want to make sure you have my updated headshots for, for all those slide decks. But um, It's just what I get from the Google search, so I don't, I don't know what I have. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, thanks you all for making our conversation today. Um, I am really excited to be amongst friends talking about some really important work. Um, I'll start off by sharing, I come to this sector, this field, this conference from someone who's worked in social justice work. 
Um, and the projects that I support, we have experienced moments where we have gone to some foundations and on one side they'll actually say, you know, your project is really innovative, really exciting, we're gonna give you some money. And then I'm like, great, can you introduce us to your investment officer? And within the same institution, um, that conversation will, with the investment officer will be one of your project is actually too risky. And I lift this up to actually say, I don't know that our movement actually, our movement has not done enough to actually address the deep divides around the racial wealth gap that Rodney spoke to earlier. Um, and I think we've seen through the subprime mortgage crisis and the recent tax reform that um, that gap is only continuing to widen. And so restorative economics is a framework that calls us into being really intentional about how we reinvest resources and center the most impacted communities, right? Those that have been locked out, left behind, those that have been marginalized. I'm talking about formerly incarcerated people, low-income communities of color, trans women, undocumented people. How do we actually invest resources into the projects that need the capital in a way that helps to also move us away from an extractive economy rooted in a model of individual riches and towards shared prosperity and creating spaces where we're actually allowing those same communities to come together and have more self-determination, autonomy, and power around how their communities are designed and governed. And so this framework is very much rooted in the indigenous uh, practice of restorative justice, where we focus in on accountability, reconciliation, and repair to those communities that have been most harmed. And it's grounded in a reparations framework, acknowledging that our economy has been systemically intentional about making sure that um, communities of color, and particularly black communities, are not able to participate in a lot of the benefits um, that our economy has to offer. And so doing investments in a way that helps to repair that harm, that incorporates an element um, of healing from trauma, and that also helps to figure out how do we start to transition out of an economic model that has been harmful and into something that can be more hopeful. So that's why I call my work restorative economics. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, because I, I, I want to get a sense of, you know, why everyone comes to this work, you know, and so that would be a great way to introduce everyone. And I, one of the things that um, comes to mind for me when Amaka sets things up is, you know, the question of reparations, which I think is, is something that has been elusive um, um, in this entire conversation, the, the idea that we have to heal to get equilibrium to make sure that things are adjusted. And I also wanna make sure too, when we talk, talk about reparations, that for a lot of folks, um, that also t that oftentimes is really grounded in, particularly for African Americans, simply um, talking about like slavery, right? But the reality of it is, and I was reflecting on this recently myself, when you think about the um, number of African Americans and Latinos and others, obviously indigenous communities, um, who have been completely excluded from a historical perspective post-slavery. You know, think about the history of sharecropping in the South, for example, that kept a lot of African-American families in debt um, to white landowners. Think about the conversation in myself reflecting on this. My grandfather fought in, in Korea and was denied his GI benefits because he was African-American, right? And the, the, the ripple effect that that impacted my own family. So it's, we're not that far away from when we have this conversation about reparations. It's actually a generation, two generations. Uh, and so the impact is real. And I know that a lot of folks in this room understand that, but I just want to make sure that's pronounced because that's certainly the reason why I do this work, right? Is because it actually, it's very real to me. It's very immediate. And so I just would like to start off with everyone else just to get a sense, for example, Mariella, Alan, Ingrid, you know, what really brings you to this work? What has um, driven you to do this because it's very difficult, as we know. Um, so I would love to get a sense of what brought you here. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mariela Cedeño. Um, I'm the Director of Business Development and Lending at Mandela Partners. We're a nonprofit right across the bridge here in Oakland. Um, so the larger context, stepping outside of Mandela, uh, I'm from Venezuela, I'm from Latin America. I moved here when I was around 10 years old. Um, and I come from a family that is very much rooted in this concept of uh, equity and um, political voice. Uh, and it's really, I, I feel it's, for me, the work that I do now is very much grounded on both my history in Latin America as well as my experience as a new immigrant here in the United States. Um, and also recognizing my privilege. I had family here, I had a depth of networks, um, I was able to get residency and citizenship and all these things that other folks don't have access to. And even with that, all that privilege, I have very near um, 
memories of some of the things that impacted me as I grew up here. Uh, so I think for me, what grounds me in my work is just the recognition that there is a wealth of asset base in these communities that we're talking about, these communities that we come from, and that the reason that we aren't able to fully capitalize on the asset base is because of barriers, barriers to entry, barriers to investment, um, barriers to language, all, all of these kinds of things that keep us in um, a situation, one, that we didn't create, and two, that we don't want to continue to sustain ourselves in. Um, so that's what really grounds my work. Uh, and I would say also that whenever I think about this, I work with entrepreneurs of color um, who are coming to us for connection to resources, connection to capital, just you know therapy of walking through the entrepreneurship process. And it always really stands out to me of with everybody that we talk to that there's this really intrinsic hustle that we all have to have because we have to have it, right? Um, because we aren't coming from families of affluence where there's this very clear roadmap of where we started and where we're gonna end up. Uh, and so just by nature, folks in our communities are incredibly entrepreneurial because that's how they have to be. That's how they are able to survive and that's how we will be able to continue to build our own communities. Um, so yeah, so that's what brings me to this work. Uh, I'm based in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I'm in the middle of the map. Uh, and what brings me to the work that we do at Mortar is that we understand that there are people with talents, gifts, uh, and hustle that don't necessarily have the opportunities that other people have. Um, and so we started our work primarily working in communities that were on the brink of gentrification, uh, specifically in a neighborhood called Over the Rhine, uh, which is based in the middle of Cincinnati, um, not far from the Ohio River. And imagine across the river is Kentucky. So um, there was slavery on one side of a river, and then there were a lot of people who lost their lives attempting to cross the river to get to Cincinnati. So we are on the brink of a lot of things. Uh, and so in this community of Over the Rhine, uh, about 20 years ago it was 90% African American. 15 years ago there was a police involved shooting um, which led to uh, riots and destruction and uh, surprise uh, property values dropped. And then people purchased those properties. And the people who purchased those properties were not the people who lived in the community, nor did they resemble them. Uh, and so 15 years later, we have a situation where now the neighborhood is 60% African American. Uh, the Urban League, in a recent study, said that we were the number one uh, neighborhood for income disparity. The building where the mortar office is, is Section 8 housing above us. Across the street, there is a condo units that are $750,000. Um, so there's just this dichotomy that happens uh, when you walk down the street and this coexistence that happens uh, in this neighborhood. And I think that the thing that really was the kicker for us was when the gentrified soul food restaurant opened. Uh, and <laughs> nothing does it like mac and cheese, you know? Uh, <laughs> so you have these, these, these aunts and these grandmothers and all of these people who have been making soul food for generations and maybe even selling plates of soul food after church, but they just don't know how to convert that hustle into a legitimate business and they're trying to figure that out. And for us, walking down the street and realizing that uh, about at that time about 2% of the businesses were uh, owned and operated by African Americans, uh, in a neighborhood that was at that time about 75% African American was the that was the the thing the spark that we needed to get started uh, and so we just started reaching out to people all of the my past collections of entrepreneurship finally are being used at this point I started my first business at 12 you know uh, I met Gordon Parks and I said I want to be a photographer. And then I understood that from just that really brief interaction, how valuable it is to see people do something that maybe you've never seen them do, and then understanding that there was a spark that happened, but then also being from a point of privilege where my parents could do something about it. So they went out and bought me a camera. But then understanding that there are people who have that spark, but then they don't have someone 
to assist them to get to that next thing. And so we have become the people who assist them in getting to that next thing. So once they have that idea or they have that spark and they're trying to figure out how do I get to the next thing, we've become the bridge for them to get them to that next thing. Um, Jordan Parks. Gordon Parks. JT. JT. There's a children's book, JT, about a little boy that finds a little cat. And Gordon Parks says the pictures. It's amazing. Anyway, children's book. Kids lit. Hi, everyone. Um, I, um, it's take, I've taken a long and windy road myself getting to this work. Um, and I think in the um, quest to identify the opportunities to, um, to support and uh, community self-development efforts, um, understanding that that's where the solutions lie, in the community already, uh, and recognizing the, the ways in which systems from the beginning of our, our, our country have influenced the tamping down of those solutions' ability to bubble up. What's the way that those solutions are, are undermined uh, and, 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 and not brought to life? So I was an elementary school teacher seeing the school as a beacon for that, seeing No Child Left Behind and the way that that eroded that, um, and, 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 and looking at you know, what's the way that small business can be that, uh, particularly um, building off of what's been spoken here, which is that there's such a hustle and entrepreneurial spirit in disenfranchised communities and what is the way that small business can be, the, the concepts of small business can be demystified. It is not rocket science. Uh, and what is the way that business, small business can be a vehicle for wealth creation? I mean, that's, that's what we're here talking about. Uh, what is the way that, what is the role that small business plays in generating wealth and beginning to break this cycle where the systems have put in place to keep people from having assets, agency, a seat at the table. And so I at once live in, I, some days I wake, I'm Swedish Lydian, so we're a dark thinking people. Um, I sometimes wake up and feel like I'm living in a post-apocalyptic world and uh, you know, can kind of spin out about that. And then at the other moment, I can be feel really inspired by work that's happening and solutions that are being lifted up. And the what I think of as emergent strategy around what are the inch wide, mile deep solutions that are here in this, at this conference in our communities, um, even amidst what I think we can all acknowledge is a bit of a contradiction. You know, you have, I'm now spinning out about my, my uh, hope to be my friend, Anand G. Winners take all, he's totally spun me out. Um, reading the Duke report that Rodney, who always has like his finger on the pulse of the latest report, talking about what are the myths of, what are the myths of what is creating the, the racial wealth gap? And it's interesting because you read the report and, and please read this report, maybe we can, I don't know, somehow share it, but it talks about sort of the fa false causal relationships and those, those myths are being brought up even here at this conference as real. And I think what's the way that we all can lift that out and, and what are the spaces that we can have those conversations? I think that's, that's what's exciting or it's depressing, right? So I, you know, what brings me to the work? Understanding that we can live in a contradiction, we can live in a place where we're seeing such disparity. What is the way that our work can contribute to that? And how can we learn from each other? Thank you for that, guys. Um, so, you know, obviously we could talk about the challenges all day, but the purpose of this is actually we've got some solutionists, right? So we wanna have a conversation about that. And I wanna point out a few things, like to emphasize the fact that um, particularly, I mean, we talk about communities of colors and empowering communities of color. I mean, as, as has been said a couple of times, folks have been hustling, have been entrepreneurial. This is not, um, it's not something like we have to bring entrepreneurship to a community, right? 
Um, and, and so I want to make sure that we're framing it in that way um, and noting that this is something that, I, you know, like thinking about what Ingrid pointed out, this isn't new, right? There's a lot of false and false things and also myths. And I want to point out that it's not just historical, it's, it's, it's current day, right? And so that's why it's important to have these solutions. I mean, how many banks recently, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and others um, have been having to pay fines for their racially discriminatory practices when it comes to lending to and supporting communities of color, right? This is active, this is today, right? Um, and thinking from the fact of when I, I see my, my, my friends like Jessica Norwood and Nina Robinson um, here and looking at how Jessica was able to identify the racial wealth gap as a barrier to creating businesses for African Americans, right? Just to situate it again, 140,000 median wealth for white households, about 12,000 for African American. Um, and so you talk about a profound gap, you know, it costs, according to Kaufman Foundation, $30,000 to start a new business. Um, in 2015, the SBA determined, uh, noted that 70% of white applicants to their 70 uh, living uh, lending program, um, uh, white applicants were receiving uh, loans and only 2% of African Americans. Again, active today, right? So I just want to make sure that we're, when, we, when we situate this conversation about inequities, it's not like, it's, it's, yes, it's historical, um, but as Faulkner said, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. We live in the past. We, the past comes with us. So I just want to continuously uplift that. Now, that said, what are some of the things that you guys are working on um, that give you that inspiration and that hope um, that Ingrid was talking about to be optimistic about the path moving forward? I'll start. Um, for, for us in Mortar, I'm, I'm thankful that you reframed the conversation because um, as we all know, Uber is not brand new. Um, there was a black dude doing Uber at the grocery store like 40 <laughs> years ago, you know? Well, yes, for those of us who don't know, there was a black dude doing Uber 40 years ago at the grocery store. He just stayed at the grocery store all day, and when he saw you coming out with too many bags, he's like, do you need a ride? So we've been doing car sharing. Like, it was, you know, we just didn't have the app. And so I think that on our end, what we're trying to do is help people figure out how to legitimize the hustle. We don't want them to change the hustle, we just want them to polish the hustle. Um, so we look at, at the, the hustles that they have right now as the, the raw diamonds. And when they go through our processes of our 14 week entrepreneurship accelerator, our 18 uh, month uh, alumni program, we are taking them through the process of cutting facets and then polishing the stone but we want them to keep that hustle. Um, so for uh, people who are coming to us after they're returning from prison, I always tell people, hey, what you did to get there, we get a lot of people who were selling dope. That requires a lot of math. I don't know how to do that kind of math. It's like metric system and so I'm like, no. So <laughs> I'm like, you're really, really smart, but let's take that ingenuity and let's flip it into something else, you know, and, and so, don't lose all of that intellect. Don't lose all of those abilities. Don't lose that hustle. Uh, but now we take the hustle and we reprocess it into something else that can be something that benefits your family, something that builds a legacy in your community. So for us, it's figuring out how to reprocess those things, those gifts, those talents, those abilities, and those hustles and make sure that we can reprocess them so that they are something that is legitimate, where they are paying taxes, where they don't have to look over their shoulder every five minutes, um, and they can they can live a life of, of peace where they're actually giving back to that community. Um, I would I would tag into this framework of legitimizing the hustle to also just explicitly name that the ways in which communities of color have also tried to legitimize their hustle has been criminalized, right? Like having the police called on a young person selling water in front of their house, right? Like not allowing undocumented uh, immigrants or immigrant communities to actually be food vendors because they have to go through all these steps and processes to fill out forms that aren't in their language that they can't get to the op So I'm just lifting that up to say like the levels of hurdles that people have to even cross to be able to dream and hope that their business could be a brick and mortar is um, 
is just something to take stock of in the work that we do. And so for those communities that have been able to, to get over those barriers um, is something a testament to itself. So that one piece. I think um, some of the businesses that I would love to lift up because I would love you guys to like bum rush these people at the end of the panel. Um, I think the partnership between the Runaway Project, Self Help and Uptima um, Business Incubator is really exciting because but they're not just supporting um, entrepreneurs and first getting access to capital, but also thinking about how do we how do we set up an infrastructure, the scaffolding of technical assistance uh, providers that also make sure that these businesses are successful? Um, in the last panel I was speaking on, there was a conversation around like, well, we just need to put out a call for more entrepreneurs to apply to get the capital. But to even like go through the process of making sure that you're ready, um, your business ready for investment, it takes some time. And so I think that is a model that does a really good job in ensuring that we're setting people up for success. So if Annie and Jessica and Nina, you guys wanna raise your hand, learn more about them afterwards. Um, and then I would also highlight, um, I am a proud board member of Thousand Currents. Um, and Thousand Currents um, is a grant maker um, that has done amazing work in bringing together their partners in the global north and in the global south to actually rethink the terms into which we invest capital into communities, right? And so they've actually structured um, a fund, the Buen Vivir Fund, focused on creating good lives for all people. Right? and structuring it in a way in which they bring together investors um, and people looking to receive capital to recognize that while investors may be bringing financial knowledge and resources to the table, the partners are also bringing a lot of knowledge, expertise, um, and experience in how do we actually um, share capital in a way that is not doubling down on harm, right, but is actually creating some hope. And I think their model around doing a poor taste where you actually pay, um, the profit that you make above the principal back into the fund so that you can reinvest it back into your community as opposed to look at looking at interest where we actually take it back into the investor. I think there are great models out there where people are really trying to tink tinker with um, how do we structure our businesses in a way that like actually helps to transform our communities. Um, the last project I'll lift up is a project that I've been able to support for a few years, the Restore Oakland Project. Um, so two organizations in the Bay Area, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and Restaurant Opportunity Centers United, um, coming together to actually create a restorative justice and community advocacy training center and really jumping through the hurdles of what it means to purchase real estate in this wild market of the Bay Area um, to secure a loan and to actually be able to create a safe and sacred space where their members, formerly incarcerated people, workers in the restaurant industry, can come together to engage in restorative justice programs, to get training in the restaurant industry um, as part of the ways we actually start to build institutions that help to create strong and vibrant communities. So those are a few different models that um, I think are really inspiring and exciting. Oh, and Rajiv is with uh, 1000 Currents, so you can bombard him about the Buen Vivir Fund. Yeah, they're all sitting next to each other, so just find one <laughs> and you'll get all of them. Um, I just wanted to add something that I think we've all touched upon um, and, and ground it in my work at Mandela is that we actually came from this originally not from the economic development side, it was more around health and access to food. Um, and in that work, in engaging with community and trying to figure out how do we as an entity, as a nonprofit, as a partner, uh, help lift up those solutions. What really came out of that was that the, the, the crucial piece that needed to be addressed was economics, right? Um, and also in that, that there, were a plen there was plentiful solutions that were coming out of these groups, out of residents around how they could address health disparity, but also economic disparity. And so, and I say that to say that um, in, in all of this, in all of our work, I think one of the things that's, that has grounded me is, again, to really uplift that there's already assets there and there's already solutions in communities. Like entrepreneurship's not new. The idea of like having a challenge, thinking it through and coming up with a solution is not new. Uh, and that what also that, may, that comes as a, maybe a different point that we all do is that we're not coming at it from the capital side of trying to like get sales leads and trying to get money out there. We're really coming at it from the community engagement side and from the technical assistance provision side. And so whenever I think of the folks that we work with, like sometimes they don't come for us, they don't come to us for capital at all, right? It's like they're trying to think about how to formalize an idea or just how to expand an idea or, or whatnot. And the reason that we ended up getting into capital was because we kept finding that as we got folks ready, 
even with mission aligned lenders. And especially in being in this kind of conference, which is about impact investment, not seeing impact, right? Like continually hearing these like really large global disruptive ideas around how you build impact, but that was missing in this backyard in the Bay Area. Um, so a lot of our work has been around trying to figure out where we plug in to supporting folks getting through that sort of ladder, right? Um, and so the reason we got into capital was because we were finding mission aligned investors and saying like, here's this person who is from the community that has this like longevity of history of entrepreneurship that has all these different folks around them who are providing the technical resources and still they weren't getting funded, right? And the reasons they weren't getting funded were grounded in the reasons that there isn't money in the community to begin with, right? There was a lack of collateral, which has to do with this investment, with fracturizing communities. There was a lack of credit history, like how do you get credit if you don't have money to begin with? Um, and then there was a lack of just belief that communities of color could do these things, right? This idea that these investments were riskier. So we ended up taking on and building our own loan fund, our community capital fund, because there was a need to do that. Um, and I say that to, to sort of push back to some of you who are here as investors to say that we actually, we've had 100% repayment, and I don't wanna set that as a standard because I don't think it should be, but we've had it because we've come through this channel of community engagement first, technical assistance second, and then capital, right? And that our entire community fund is not built around trying to get interest rates and trying to capitalize our operations, it's built around reinvestment. Like how do we reinvest in communities? Um, and the last thing I'll say and, and have sort of these things have come up is one of the things that we found, especially in more anchor projects, like working to open a cafe, working to open, uh, to partner with folks who are wanting to open a grocery store or a food hall or all these, all these different sorts of solutions around access and economic development is that even when folks are very um, technically sound and capital ready, that this idea of equity, and I mean actually financial equity, still comes to play, right? Like why do people not have collateral? There's long historical reasons of why they don't. And so we've actually started to think about how do we pair sort of free money that should have always been there with capital, right? So if folks are testing an idea and they wanna get formal, how do we help them just get a grant or give them a grant to get a permit to get them to test that and then bring them into the capital pipeline? Because the reason they don't have money for permits, again, is historical. Um, so I just wanna sort of talk through that process because I think the fact that we aren't leading with this idea of generating profits for an entity that needs to get loans out puts us in a very different position. Um, and also to say that really being mindful of the asset base also puts us in a different position. Like we have lots of folks who are calling, coming through the door all the time. There's just not a lack of it. There's so many things to talk about together. I think we need another hour. <laughs> okay, we'll hang out after. I. Um, so, so one thing that in preparation for this uh, conversation that got lifted out was the way in which we can learn together and lift up what's working. And so there's just a lot of seeds that are being planted that I hope we can continue um, talking about. And I, and, I, and I think that that's reflected in, in work that, uh, you know, in the organization that I work in, ICA Fund Good Jobs, and also with partners that have already been shouted out, but no sense in not shouting them, shouting them out again. Runway project for one here in the room. Um, so we have been around for 22 years and I think came out of this place where Michael Porter's initiative for competitive inner city and that um, at a point in which inner city was a geographic location, it was the inner city, not code, um, for disenfranchised uh, communities of color. And I, and, and, and so, jobs were at the forefront of that. You know, if you, if you um, put uh, resources, high caliber resources into the, the centers of cities which didn't have a lot going on 22 years ago, then um, jobs would be created and that would have its cascading impacts in the community. Well, we now know jobs aren't wealth creating vehicles and that the erosion of job quality, especially entry level, is also eroding. You have, you know, the, you can look at um, employment levels and, and, and see that, you know, the, the, the percentage of unemployment is dropping, but what are those jobs that are, that are qualifying? Um, and who's actually just given up on looking for a job? Because then you don't get counted anymore either. And so then it's, so we look at, we, we came looking at, okay, well, let's work with companies that are generating lots of jobs. Okay. 
Well, then we began to, because we're sort of never satisfied group of people, um, well, what's the quality of those jobs? And then actually who's getting those jobs? And what are, rather than centering um, individuals as the, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and hearing language like, oh, you have a barrier to get a job. No, 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 no. The job has a barrier. And what's our role in supporting entrepreneurs to become better employers? And how do you begin to measure and the, the ways in which job quality can improve even when you're at an early stage of business? And so we, you know, we take a crack. We have this thing, we call it the good employer matrix. It's an internal tool that we measure baseline so that folks don't get sued, you know, HR compliance, but all the way up to, you know, what are the free, cheap things that you can do that improve the culture, that improve opportunities to grow, whether inside the job or outside, you know, but still not quite satisfied with that. Um, and so then when you hear all about and understand and it sinks in that a job actually isn't enough, and individuals, you know, it's really about a system. What is the way that our work uh, can begin to lift out solutions that are um, creating, uh, closing the wealth gap? So what, what do we do there? And that's when it goes to this capital bit. Um, bit. It's a big bit. Um, it's, a, it's a big bit. So, so, so the work that we do, we have a, um, we do, we do um, entrepreneurship education. We have an accelerator. It's a, it's a advisory accelerator um, tailored per business. We work with businesses in operation. It's like an, it's like a six to nine month engagement. Karan's here repping for the accelerator. She's a bad, she's a badass. Okay, so that's just what that is. So, and there's so, um, and then we have we're a very small CDFI, a community development financial institution. So we're able to invest, but we really also leverage uh, capital in the community. And there's a lot of capital in the community. Uh, and there's a lot of people doing amazing work, microloans and people who, are, who, who get it. It's just incomplete. It's incomplete. And so you've got solutions to lift up like Runway, which is saying, well, what happens and what's the place in which we're meant to um, insert capital at the right time and the right amount and with the right support? And so our accelerator and our services aim to do that. We want to be perfect at that. We want to be great at that. And we also want to uh, identify the partners that we need to do it because we can't, no one person's gonna do it alone. And then how does that influence the system? Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Sorry, I just wanted to like explicitly tease out something that I think is embedded within everything we all just sh shared and the work that we all do that I think is really important to lift up is that the businesses that we're all supporting and speaking about are, in, are a base for organizing, right? Are a base for organizing around political power. And so we actually get to, the ability to work with small businesses where you could potentially have a small business council that wants to work alongside movement groups, movement organizations to figure out how can we work with your small business to understand the right timing and sequencing of actually phasing in a living wage standard, right? Rather than being in opposition. And so when we have social enterprises and businesses that share the same values of a lot of the social movements as well, we can start to think about how to be strategically organize each other so that as activists and business owners side by side, we can start to shift what's happening in our local ecosystem to also create more equity, right? And change the conditions for people on the ground. And then the other piece, um, which I think is also super important to tease out about the capital once again is um, oftentimes the projects that we support, the businesses that we're really trying to advocate for are going to investors that have already set the terms, right? We actually need to understand if you were an investor that's invested and deeply cares about social impact, let's first understand what is the social impact this business is trying to make on the ground, what is the capital that they need, what are the, what are the terms under which they need it, and then let's structure the capital from that, rather than com coming top down with the terms, right? What does the grass, um, the grassroots, you know, inside up work look like um, as we're trying to right size capital with social impact? Thank you for that. And I, I would just segue to say that um, social impact's one thing, and believe in it, and what we're really talking about, though, is acknowledging and closing the racial wealth gap. 
right? So having a specific and explicit purpose, and, when I, and even then it's, it's kind of limiting because we're talking about really building wealth and power for folks. So I just want to be explicit about that conversation because a lot of times I think in these spaces, social impact doesn't actually connect to, um, to driving this sort of economic transformation that the folks on this panel and a lot of folks in this room are working on. Um, and so my final question, not everyone has their answer because I want to make sure we have time for like one or two questions. But I want to also talk about this concept of risk. Uh, and in two phases, I know this came up in the, in the pre-call, but risk in the sense of, you know, African Americans, indigenous, indigenous communities, Latino entrepreneurs are risky. And I want to provide a framework that I've, I've been fascinated by, because um, I know tech was a part of the conversation. And in, in, in tech, it's okay to fail. And in fact, when you look at the numbers, you're talking about about $80 billion in the U.S. alone for VC, venture capital. 73% um, of VC-backed uh, companies are founded by white, founded by and owned by white men, and about 75% of them don't return capital to their investors. So, in this framework, and then Mariella is talking about she's got 100%, um, you know, rate of ret uh, rate of return. Um, and I was with Bill Bynum from Hope Credit in Jackson. He's talking about he's got a 3% default rate working in the Delta, where he's investing in black and brown folks in the Delta where we've been told that you cannot invest in folks like that. So I just want to think about, just flip the conversation a bit and like talk about risk and following up in terms of what uh, Maka was pointing to, who's actually bearing the risk, right? Because it seems like black and brown folks are bearing all the risk, really, <laughs> um, when we talk about the terms of investment. So I would like you guys to respond to that. Again, not everyone has to, but I uh, would love to get your I'm perspective. Gonna. Um, Give me that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I live in the Bay Area, um, and I'm always, and because, you know, when you live here, you're just touched by tech constantly. Um, and it's always been so impressive in a good and bad way how, man, how many times they hear of the same person failing a tech company, right? Um, failing it, building something, it fails, they build, they fail, they build, they fail, they build, they fail, and they continue to get VC funding. Right? Like they continue to get some funding from some place because there is an inherent belief in that person that if they fail, they will iterate, they will innovate, and they will do again. And one of those iterations, innovations, will succeed. Um, then I have sort of the other side, which is you know, when we're working at, with the folks that we work with in our communities that look like us, where that system is set up very differently. Right? If somebody fails one time, then money is no longer available in that community at all. Um, and also to say that if they failed one time, imagine if they were given that same runway to continue to innovate, iterate, fail, innovate, until they come up with something that really works and that looks like the community and that serves the community. Um, so that's, always, that's been on my mind for a really long time. And when I was saying that, you know, yes, we have 100% repayment, but I don't want to set that precedent, is that part of the reason that we did was because we, when we capitalized our loan fund, we got capital with terms that were not ours, right? And so we set terms that were not also ours, and we had borrowers, partners, clients, community residents who knew that this was an opportunity they would get nowhere else. And so, and also that like, I see them all the time. I know where they live. I like see them when I walk from BART, um, that they didn't want to fail us. They didn't want to fail me. And that was something that I um, just found so intrinsically like in opposition because at the same time I was looking at P&Ls, I was looking at cash flows and thinking to myself, if they didn't pay this loan, this, this term debt they have, they could be investing in staff, they could buy this equipment that could make their life easier. Um, and so, you know, I think that those are two things that we really have to think about when we think about impact, um, is one, who's burdening the risk, why we think that people are risky, and the importance of failing, right? The importance of having space for failure in, in, in any space, in any industry. Um, and then the last piece that I'll say to that too is what you just brought up, which is dope, is that we're coming, you know, the, the microfinance industry, the CDFI industry, like mission in investment has been around for a while, right? And so there's a lot of sophistication that's happened in that time and a lot of systems that have been in place that everybody just takes on. You start a new MFI and there's this sort of like toolkit of how you're supposed to do it, right? Like what your top you know, your top line is on loans, what the term should look like, what the interest rate should be like, what your default rate could be, like all these things. And they're not meeting who they're supposed to meet, 
right? So we keep building the same thing over and over and over again, not thinking about the actual borrower, about the person who we're trying to capitalize. And so that's another piece too that I think about all the time is like, when people, you know, we started putting together a, like a, a policies around our lending, it never looks the same, right? It doesn't look the same to a farmer because they have very different needs. It doesn't look the same to a restaurant. It doesn't look the same to somebody who's trying to like make some dope vegan cookies. It just never looks the same. And if you make it look the same, you're setting up folks for failure, right? And so you're creating the failure that they're trying to mitigate to begin with. So I think for us, the best way that we mitigate risk, one is relationship based and two is creating terms that actually serve the borrower. So um, I just think about the cascade of undercapitalization and what does it mean if you're coming to the, you're coming to the table and you've been operating your business with the hustle and that might mean overextending your credit cards and then therefore you fit the perfect risk profile of not getting any more money from anybody else. And then, you know, you have on the other hand, which I think Mariela, um, you know, alluded to, but I just want to take a second longer to say, then there's scrappy organizations like ours, and we have investors and, you know, um, foundations and donors that, that, that want us to shoulder risk and do innovation things, but actually hold us to market world standards of return. And that's not going to work out. And that's not how it works. Um, but it, it does, it, you sort of see the churn in being um, what it feels like to, to, to be held to a standard, not just the entrepreneur who's looking at you saying, I don't want to let you as an organization down, and, and how is it that that social capital is really strengthened through the relationship, but also thinking about, you know, we've made some seed investments with PRI dollars, and PRI dollars, which is um, project-related investment, um, that's essentially a loan to an organization and then we have to pay it back. And what does it mean in terms of how that creates terms for that we have to set? And, and, and so we can say that sort of practically speaking, um, we also tailor, tailor those investments through convertible notes and um, shoulder the greatest risk. So then others can participate and get their return. And it still isn't a perfect system, you know? So you could, that's great that we play that role and maybe that's a stepping stone and it's not the solution, right? It just puts us on a path to show what solutions could be. Thank you for that because I think it's, it's really important to understand that organizations like Runway Project, uh, ICA Fund Good Jobs, Mandela Partners, et cetera, Mortar, um, are undercapitalized themselves and actually reflect <laughs> the kind of entrepreneurs um, that they're working with and supporting. And you know, I had this realization um, you know, our, our friends at AEO, uh, Association of Enterprise Opportunity, they did this report last year about the fact that business ownership for African Americans in particular has surpassed home ownership as the vehicle for closing the, the wealth gap, right? So I just want to send to the fact this is why we're having these conversations. Um, and to note that when we talk about technical assistance or trusted guidance, as AEO will call it, the reality of it is that when we look at, if we were to compare it to the venture capital world, where I think something like 50% of VCs went to Stanford or Harvard, when you go to those sort of universities, you have that built-in technical assistance and trusted guidance, right? You're actually paying, what, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year to get that. And so I want to point that out because when you look at the kind of organizations that are represented on this panel um, and in the audience, there has to be a similar capitalization vehicle to ensure that we have, and flexibility, um, to ensure that we're able to support um, the kind of entrepreneurs that we're talking about. So that said, um, I think we have enough time if people ask questions succinctly um, uh, to have a few questions. Um, so if you if you could raise your hand, we have a volunteer that will walk around with a mic um, so that they can identify you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I was uh, I just have a question around. Well. Yesterday I was having lunch with a friend of mine, uh, Ann Stuhldreher, who's the Director of Financial Justice for the City of San Francisco. She's doing a lot of work in criminal justice reform. And she said something really interesting about how she has found in her work that uh, kind of bridges the aisle. She has found that um, the Koch brothers, or Grover Norquist, who she sat on a panel with, actually are very interested in this topic. So I'm just curious, kind of putting aside all the other issues that we have with them, uh, have you guys found in your work that you, um, 
have seen interest from the right uh, as well around some of these issues that you're trying to address with the work that you're doing. I'd love to know more. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know more, and I'm curious to know more um, because I'll, I'll raise it like this. What we've also seen in the movement around mass incarceration is that the right has wanted to engage in that conversation because they've actually figured out it's not a smart business decision, right, for the country, right, for government. Um, and so they're coming to it from a fiscal analysis position and less from a human rights, civil rights, just these people deserve some dignity because they're human beings. And so, um, I, while I think it's great to find ways in which we can meet um, in the middle, um, meet across the aisle, um, I am di I'm deeply invested and interested in solutions that um, lift up the humanity and dignity of all people um, and recognize the importance that our, um, recognize the importance of ensuring that there's equitable, equitable distribution of resources. So I would actually be curious to know more about how um, I'm curious if Grover Norquist is going to help us reform Proposition 13, right? Are they actually going to help us fix the tax and fiscal policies that have made it so that people who have lived in Oakland, deep east Oakland, for decades now have to move out into the valley because they can't afford, afford it anymore, whereas, you know, other people are just transferring property. So um, I think the, the underlying... The underlining beliefs behind why people engage in this work is actually important. And this gets back to this piece um, one of the panelists had also mentioned around the habits and patterns of what we're in, right? If we actually don't call out our habits and patterns, even if even in our event to do something that we think is socially good or socially right, we may actually end up replicating the same harms and ills because we haven't actually wrestled with and been accountable for the way we have hurt and impacted communities. So I'm curious to learn more. Um, and I know a couple people at the financial justice um, institution, so um, I would be curious. I would love to have that conversation. So um, I can look at it from the perspective at Bali where we have a pretty wide range of political affiliation. So I'm going to take away Grover Norquist, for example, because that's one thing. And I'm going to take away the Koch brothers. And I think when you look at communities, uh, when you get local, um, people are able to really have, be in a relationship with folks. So I would note that there are folks in our network that I would say are certainly more on the um, certainly right of center, uh, it might be the best way of putting it, that are investing in African-American Latino entrepreneurs because they see it as they're, they're, they're in a relationship with folks. Right. So, so I think if you're if you're talking about like the bigger like that 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 larger uh, infrastructure of conservative uh, movement versus like the individual action that I can see happening in local communities, those are two different conversations. But I do see there are folks who, you know, relate to a uh, more conservative politics that I see that are invested in these kind of issues. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. They want they want to make sure they capture it for the. <laughs> I am trying to find the way to phrase this because uh, it's interesting. Do you come into contact with struggles of different cultural, uh, well, cultural diversity? Because when you were talking about indigenous uh, resilience and taking that restorative justice. Have you witnessed the conversations around decolonization? because when it ties into how it hits our communities, there are ways that, uh, I'll call it colonial entitlement, that tends to um, dominate mainstream society, that we must capitalize off resources, that we must see things as assets, and we are a very extractive, consumeristic, uh, we are at a capitalistic approach. And when it comes to the systemic change, it's not just business, but I think education. And I'm, I'm wondering, have you encountered that in your work? Uh, so for us, it's, it's a lot of deconstruction of things that have been built. Uh, but also it is understanding how to play the game and rewriting rules for our community. Uh, so in a lot of the sessions that I've been in, it's been about, you know, community ownership. And, um, you know, we, we've kind of developed a, a pathway that 
works for us. Um, so far, so it's you know going to the accelerator, then going to the alumni program, which is technical assistance. Then uh, we have the Iron Chest Fund, which is capitalization. Then our next phase is to purchase properties so that our entrepreneurs can actually live and work in their communities and they actually have ownership of these spaces, uh, which allows them to be in a position where they can hire from the community, where they can continue to grow the wealth of the community in general and personal wealth and build legacy. So for us, we are taking people who are oftentimes more focused on the survival of today uh, and, and teaching different systems and teaching different uh, thought patterns of shifting from surviving to thriving and thinking of long term when a lot of people don't have the luxury of time to think about what is the future going to look like. So I probably didn't answer your question, but yeah. I love your, I love your question. I think um, Nina, my sister friend, she's in the audience, I love you so much, um, she pointed out at some point in our work together that you know transformation comes from, well, transformation, what's the opportunity for transformation? It either, if, if I'm to reduce it down to two things for the purpose of this conversation, comes from within the system. Like how do you work from within the system to change it? Or do you break the system? And I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an either or, I actually think it's a both and, and that's that whole thing about the inch wide, mile deep, which is we have to be able to lift out these things that may not, these solutions, this, this work that might not be visible to how do we lift it up? Because then we can see the ways that, that there actually are these bridges between that. I also, I mean, specifically language, like the narrative that we all are participating in simply by even just being here, right? The contradiction in the language, you know, the win-win, the doing well by doing good, and that that's false, right? That's false. And so what is the way that we, that we do our work and continue to question? And I think it's by having these kinds of questions being asked and then being open to saying, yeah, wow, how is it that I'm using words that are actually, um, falling into the power structure. Like what's the way in which by saying, yeah, capitalizing on or talking about, I think that, I mean, even, um, you know, what does it mean to have a model? And is, is that not a, a, a tool of, of, of colonialism, right? And so it's these conversations that allow us to even look at that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's that question makes, opens an opportunity for us to all think about how do we um, break free of that. Um, and then I would quickly um, add that I think this is a great place to actually engage with the folks of the Buen Bavir Fund, so the work that Nina and Rajiv are doing. Um, the Buen Bavir Fund has, um, has experienced um, investors who want to come and support it. And they're actually really clear about, we actually need to be in deep relationship with you, know who you are as a person, and if you want to come to the table correct, before you can actually even invest into the fund. So they spend time building the relationships um, and really vetting people to ensure that people aren't bringing their baggage um, or their practices of colonialism into how the fund is structured and invested in. Um, and so this is a place where even even taking, taking the time um, to do that relationship building takes, takes money, right? It, ta it costs money, but that's money well spent because we're actually ensuring that we're not replicating the same harm back into our communities. And so they've gone through, um, they've gone through an amazing process um, that has actually humbled a number of people in all different spaces, including myself, to actually challenge this notion of collateral that Mariella brought up this definition of risk, uh, how we look at interest rates, and have embedded that into how they actually set up the terms of their investment capital. So the Buen Vivir Fund it would be a really concrete um, project to look into. I just want to, that's such an amazing and, and huge question that we could talk about forever. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about a bit is, you know, we've always wrestled, like, one of the first businesses we supported was a cooperative, and people always think of us as, like, a co-op developer, and it's definitely something that's in our ethos and we want to continue to talk about, but when we've brought it, you know, to folks who are thinking about putting a project together, that, that doesn't, doesn't always resonate with them, right? Or at least maybe that word doesn't, but the, the innate ideals do, um, and I bring this up to say that I think that 
part of, um, I don't know if it's like quite as, as heavy as decolonization, which is a big one, but part of sort of shifting that, those systems of continuing to extract or, or systems that continue to ca cause harm is who you invest in. And I actually think that because we're investing in community and community residents, there's already that there. Um, and I see that very often, right? Like when we have sort of education or conversations around sourcing locally, like your food, totally open to it, right? It's just about knowing how to. Or when we talk about, we just had a conversation with one of uh, the businesses we work with that has a cafe about hiring recently incarcerated folks or folks that have had been touched by the criminal justice system, totally open to it. And a lot of the reasons for that around, specifically around hiring people who have barriers to entry or whatever you want to call it, is that they are directly touched by it every day in their own neighborhood. Um, so I, just to say that I think that in that same way that we're talking about assets already being in communities and that sense of hustle is that sense of um, investing in your community and doing good for your community is also there. Uh, and that a lot of it is just about how you speak to it and what you elevate, right? And so that when we're working with local businesses, we are by nature also elevating some of those things that disrupt that system that we're talking about. Well, I just want to thank our panelists, not only for the, taking the time to have this conversation, but actually their daily work. So we could have this conversation all day. Unfortunately, we can't. Um, but I would encourage everyone to actually look these folks up. Look up the Runway Project. Look up Thousand Carrots, right? Because these are folks that are already out there doing the work. They have a lot of stuff on their websites. And you can actually, if you do some work around identifying some of the things that they're up to, you'll be able to find, a, I think, a, a treasure trove of information and opportunity in terms of how we can live off some of these values. So thank you for attending, and thank you to the panelists.